Welcome to Singing Early Music. This video will focus on rhetorical figures and the way these sorts of passionate ornaments can be made manifest. In earlier times, both orators and singers had a wide range of rhetorical strategies at their disposal for stirring the emotions or passions of listeners. By artfully varying speech from common usage, writers and composers gave language the power to move listeners. Rhetorical figures were some of the most important tools for persuading the affections of others, and these devices painted, in the words of Henry Peacham, lively images designed to capture the hearts and minds of audiences. Eloquent persuasion, then, was rooted in rhetoric, and Abraham Franz tells us in 1588 that orators could not achieve eloquence without assiduous practice. Learn some such speech, wherein are contained all or most varieties of voice, and oftentimes pronounce the same, in such order and with as great heed, as if thou were to utter it in some great assembly. Another English writer, John Brinsley, specifically mentions practicing the orations of Tully, for they contain figures which will acquaint listeners with a wide variety of pronunciation. Franz also says that in applying the voice to several words, we make tropes, a class of figures, that be most excellent, plainly appear. For without this change of voice, neither any irony nor lively metaphor can well be discerned. And Brinsley explains how schoolchildren were taught to change their voices. Let them also be taught carefully in what word the emphasis lieth, and therefore which is to be elevated in the pronunciation, as namely those words in which the chief trope or figure is. By emphasis, Brinsley means stress, and elevation refers to the change of voice that causes a word or words to be highlighted, often by making them louder. To make figures plainly appear then, orators and singers changed their delivery to suit the passions they wished to invoke in listeners. Striking examples of powerful rhetorical devices are found in the figures of repetition. Epizuxis, the immediate restatement of a word or two for greater vehemency, embodies a compositional decision to stress and thus elicit in the listener the state of mind associated with that word or words. In 1599, John Hoskins maintained that orators should not use this figure except in passion, and Henry Peacham further notes that epizuxis may serve aptly to express the vehemency of any affection, whether it be of joy, sorrow, love, hatred, admiration, or any such like. In respect of pleasant affections, it may be compared to the quaver in music, in respect of sorrow, to a double sigh of the heart, and in respect of anger, to a double stab with a weapon's point. John Barton, a 17th century writer, provides an example of the figure and suggests how speakers could make it plainly appear. As in every word some syllable is pronounced more acutely, so in every clause some word is uttered with more vehemency than the rest, as the first two words in this clause must be. Another 17th century writer provides further advice on how orators should deliver the figure. Repeated words, we are told, should be given a different sound by pronouncing them far louder and stronger than on the first statement. Songwriters frequently expand the notion of epizuxis to include not just one or two words, but lengthier phrases, and the song literature is filled with examples of both types. Henry Purcell amplifies Not All My Torments with eight repetitions of the words I love to underscore the depth of passion the protagonist feels. In applying 17th century principles of delivery to the passage, singers might consider varying their delivery 
to give each statement its own emotional impact. As Daniel Thompson does on his recording of the song included in the album, Secret Fires of Love. I love, 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 In this first example, Purcell chose not to parallel the textual epizuxis with a musical figure. But many composers, Purcell included, frequently coupled rhetorical and musical figures to create even more evocative moments in their songs. Another of Purcell's songs, What a Sad Fate is Mine, illustrates typical combinations of musical rhetorical devices. In the middle of the excerpt shown on the screen, Purcell set the single repetition of Tis All to the musical figure Polyptoton, and then coupled it to the next text member through Anadiplosis, a figure in which the last word of one clause becomes the beginning of the next, to give a certain increase to the second member. Music theorists in the 18th century defined Polyptoton as the repetition of a melodic fragment at another pitch level. And with this device, composers could expand the textual sentiment through notes which diverge in form because they occur on different pitches, but which have the same meaning, because the intervallic integrity of the fragment has been maintained. The following passage has two levels of epizuxis in it. The phrase, to make me love less, is restated in conjunction with musical palologia. Burmeister defined palologia as the repetition of a melodic fragment at the same pitch. According to Charles Butler in 1636, such musical repetitions serve to increase the listener's understanding of the subject matter. Purcell then repeats the entire line, to make me love less or herself to love more, through musical palologia but not before he applies further epizuxus to the word more, itself coupled to musical gradatio. In rhetoric, gradatio is a figure in which listeners are led by degrees to the height of some matter, as demonstrated by the sentence on the screen. Rhetoricians regularly compared the figure to stairs, degrees, steps, or ladders, and through a series of graduated increments, the device increases the vehemence of the passions in a climbing manner. A 17th century writer suggested how such figures should be delivered. Where the discourse climbs up by several clauses of a sentence to a period or full point, it is manifest that the voice must be raised accordingly by the same degrees of elevation to answer every step of the figure till it is at the utmost height of it. The musical equivalent of this powerful rhetorical figure was defined in the 18th century as a passage immediately repeated several times at progressively higher pitches. In the example on the screen, Purcell employs just a single note on each step of the ladder, and the intent of pairing music and rhetoric in this way should be self-evident. The repetitions of more need to become more intense as the singer progresses up the musical ladder. Similarly, the delivery of the larger-scale epizuxis and palologia at the closing of the song should also be varied, for there is no repetition without significance. Note that in the performance you will hear, Daniel Thompson not only delivers the words differently each time, but he also draws attention to the important sentiment embodied in the words, I implore, with tempo rubato, an approach suggested by Domenico Cori in 1810. What if by this day she can lessen my pain? Tis all, tis all, all I am to make me love. Love less, or to love more, more, more. 
beyond these initial examples of figurative textual and musical language. Composers often present two or more rhetorical figures simultaneously. In an anonymous villanella from the 16th century, the composer repeats the interjection, alas, at the beginning of the refrain, and this amplifies the passage through both epizuxis and exclamatio. Henry Peacham places exclamation at the head of his list of sharp figures and characterizes it as a form of speech by which the orator, through some vehement affection, as either of love, hatred, gladness, sorrow, anger, marveling, admiration, fear, or such like, bursteth forth into an exclamation or outcry, signifying thereby the vehement affection or passion of his mind. He goes on to describe the use of the figure. The principal end and use of this figure is by the vehemency of our voice and utterance, to express the greatness of our affections and passions, and thereby to move the like affections in our hearers. Most of the sentences containing these emotional outbursts begin with an exclamatory O oh, or alas. And in the 17th century, speakers were taught to pronounce such outbursts with a louder voice and a more passionate accent. An exclamation is to be spoken with a different tone from the rest of the discourse. Nothing would appear so flat and ridiculous if it were not pronounced with a louder voice and a more passionate accent. In his recording of the Villanella, Daniel Thompson varies his delivery of the repeated outburst in a subtle way, to give the exclamation renewed emotional significance on each utterance. Come la luna, mezzo le stelle, aime, aime, chi io moro miranda te. In one of his cantatas, Albinoni combines textual and musical figures to weave an intricate web of language to give performers a clear interpretive plan to follow. He begins with a three-step musical ladder, into which he embeds textual epizuxis, and then he continues with a two-step gradatio without accompanying textual figures. Next, in the middle statement of further textual epizuxis, Albanoni sets one of the words to musical gradatio. Daniel Thompson uses his knowledge of Albanoni's rhetorical strategy to give every segment of text and music its own emotional significance, while cadenzas placed at appropriate moments round out his delivery.
It is important to note that musical figures regularly appear in the song literature without accompanying textual figures. For example, in one of Giordani's most popular airs, the opening two text members are set to musical polyptoton, and Daniel Thompson gives each text idea its own emotional significance by varying his delivery of the repeated musical line. Similarly, musical gradatio often receives no additional amplification from the words, especially when the musical figure underpins a single word. In the example that appears on the screen, Daniel recognizes the rhetorical significance of the musical ladder the composer has created, and gradually increases the forcefulness of each rising step. I'd like to conclude this video with John Dowland's Sorrow Stay, a song replete with musical and rhetorical figures that can guide performers in their delivery of the air. Lutonist Terry McKenna provides an improvised prelude designed to prepare listeners for the sorrowful text Daniel is about to deliver. No 
hand there doth remain but down 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 I fall but down 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 I fall Arise down and arise. I never shall. But down, 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 I fall. I end this video with a list of the sources that have been cited.